Hello everyone. Today we are beginning to investigate a very important topic, the work of intellect. The specification of this lecture is concluded in the fact that a certain image will be given, and it requires a lot of time in order to play through all the elements which we will touch upon. That's why you don't need to worry if there is something that you may find incomprehensible. You shouldn't stop, as the mastery of all this in practice, in life, may take a lot of time. But in this lecture, you will get a mechanism of how to master this. If any of you want to apply this in practice, you can do it, but you will have to spend some time on it, around a few hours. Here, we will apply only the logic of reasoning. So, intellect is derived from the Latin word intellectus, which means mind, mindset, reason. Ordinary consciousness of a person has lost the distinction between these words. Intellect is a self-adjusting, self-changing algorithm of selecting and transforming of information as a result of which certain new informational modules are created, previously unknown to this intellect, and which, in the ready form, have not previously entered this intellect. Here is a scheme which demonstrates what working out new informational modules means. In fact, one can depict any process. Let's take an example of a primitive person who had to prepare food for himself. He, therefore, had a certain algorithm. He found some sticks, he rubbed those sticks against each other, thus making fire. Then he put some game or a piece of meat on a stick and roasted it. Then he thought, why do I have to roast it on fire? So he made up a clay pot where he put raw food to cook, which led to the same result, but the volume of his actions expanded. Nowadays, we have gas stoves, electric stoves, and so on. The essence is concluded in the fact that any algorithm is a certain particular measure through which some flows of incoming information run, and due to the expansion of this particular measure, intellect develops. In other words, intellect contributes to the expansion of measure of understanding due to the generation of new informational algorithmic modules in man's psyche. And intellect, first of all, is a process of expansion of a certain particular measure. Therefore, intellect is always present. When governing, ruling, according to the entire function of governance, when implementing the objective, goal-oriented function of governance, the conception of governance, but if there is a loss of intellect, there is always a loss of quality of governance. Remember, when we were looking into the entire function of governance, I said that governing according to the entire function of governance is possible only if one possesses creativity and intellect. Therefore, governance, generally speaking, is a reveal of a personality's intellectual creative potential. This is necessary in order to determine the factors impacting the process of governance, the object of governance, and the subject of governance. One has to work out and form goals, integrate them into the common vector of goals, work out a conception of governance. And behind all this lies precisely the work of intellect as the ability to work out new informational algorithmic modules that can ensure the qualitative implementation of the form tasks, goals, and a capability to work out such informational algorithmic modules that can contribute to the quality of governance. Further, a question arises. Is it only man that possesses intellect? Some scientists are speaking of artificial intelligence, but in doing so, some questions are posed. Is intellect a pan-natural phenomenon? If yes, then man is one of many intellects. 
Does only man possess intellect? If yes, man is unique. This is something to ponder on. Now, I will demonstrate that man is not the only one to possess intellect, but other systems, including creation as a whole, also possess intellect. Let's look into the phenomenon intellect by using the analogy of the roulette game, however strange one may find it. As an example, let's take two players. Player 1 is an environment professor. Player 2 is a system student. The system involves the lottery machine. There is also a judge who makes decisions on the results of the game. All this takes place behind the curtain. So, these players, the environment and the system are spinning the lottery machine, and the judge is monitoring their actions, as a result of which the player environment and the player system will come out from the curtain and, having obtained certain cards, will act out the performance of a student and a professor before the audience. And then it will turn out that the environment, as well as the system, possess intellect. How will this flow? We will explore an informational process on the example of prior knowing intellectless elements and strictly determined algorithms, that is, strictly determined rules. In this game, we initially proceed from the fact that the player environment and the player system do not possess intellect on their own. But as a result of certain manipulations, actions, it will turn out that they possess intellect. Do not forget to read between the lines of the following text and draw analogies from their relations between the environment and the system. How does this happen? Look. So the player environment let me remind you that an environment is something that exerts an impact on a certain system, rotates the roulette two times. The first time, the time tau is set, within which the player system has to make a counter move. The second time, a number. To put it differently, the first time the lottery machine is rotated, a ball with a number on it comes out and the roulette machine indicates the time within which a counter move has to be made by the system. The second time the lottery machine is rotated, a number comes out, which is compared with the number of the system. Next comes the second step of the game. Now, the lottery machine is rotated by both of the players, the environment and the system. What happens? First, the system spins the roulette machine within the time tau allotted by the environment. Second, there is that lottery machine in which balls with numbers drawn on them earlier are placed. That is, the lottery machine, let's say, stores the whole experience of the game between the player environment and the player system. Consequently, two numbers come out. The first one is the maximal one among the plurality of balls drawn in the roulette. The second one is the maximal one among the plurality of balls drawn from the lottery machine. Both of these numbers are written on blank balls and placed into the lottery machine. Afterwards, the system tosses a coin. Tossing a coin refers to a phenomenon which in the folk saying is expressed in the following. Even Jove nods. This is when, instead of the already known correct decision, the incorrect one is made for unclear reasons. After tossing a coin, one of those two numbers is chosen. And this one number is a response of the system to the move of the environment. As a result of this, the judge has the second number of the environment and the reciprocal number of the system. Accordingly, the judge gives cards. Depending on the number, the player environment is asked a certain question, 
and depending on the difference of the numbers of the environment and the system, a reply to the question is given. The correctness and extensiveness of the reply is determined by the difference of numbers between the environment and the system based on the criterion. The higher the measure of coincidence of the numbers, the higher the correctness. However, the criterion can be also determined in a different way. The lower the measure of coincidence of numbers, the higher the correctness. But this is not that important. The important thing is to determine this before the beginning of the game. When a stack of cards piles up, the environment professor and the system student come out to the audience and play the performance exam, where the student, question by question, looks more like a developing intellect. As the lottery machine accumulates both of the system student's losses in the roulette game, it is more probable that the losses can be compensated by a winning from the lottery machine. To put it differently, replies can emerge in the cards, question, answer, which are more correct. The system student's intellectuality can be improved. Having placed in the lottery machine, let's say, startup capital, both with numbers guaranteeing the impossibility of a major loss. Having excluded tossing a coin out of the game, the system can have more numbers to choose from but not decide on the obviously losing variant. Having increased the speed of response of the roulette and the lottery machine, in order for the system to be able to extract a large quantity of numbers, which will enable the system to accumulate more experience. The audience does not see all this, what happens behind the curtain. Possessing intellect, the audience itself makes judgments on the system's intellect. The system looks as if it has its own independent intellect, until one looks behind the curtain. All this described game is just one of the models that when its informational flows are viewed from the outside, looks like intellect. You probably know that there exists game theory where there is a set of such variants that one can look into. But this is the most suitable variant. Those who want can do the same thing, make balls with numbers on them, make cards and so on, play around and see that everything will be exactly the same. And now, having created this image the way this all happens, let's look at creation. There are planets spinning around, galaxies, comets, and so on. And so, the participants of the game in creation are The roulette. This is probabilistic predeterminations to which processes in nature are subordinate. The numbers which come out of the roulette. This is particular measures, codes of objective information. The correspondence of question and answer on the card, a particular case of a general property of a reflection of information from one fragment of the universe to another and back into the external environment from that fragment, which that general property flows in a measure common to them, the pan-universal informational code. But unlike a roulette in the casino of Monte Carlo, in creation, there are colossal volumes of information carried by the pan-natural, hierarchically multi-leveled code, measure, subordinate to probabilistic predeterminations, according to feedforward and feedback reflections. In the universe, enormous flows of information reflect by means of oscillatory processes. The judge. This is a multi-measured probabilistic matrix of possible states of matter, measure. That is to say, it is measure that determines the correctness or incorrectness, priviousness or unpriviousness of vectors of goals. The lottery machine. This is a structure which, 
more or less precisely records information inside itself on certain hierarchical levels of organization of the universe. The audience, this is consciousness, behind which, that is to say, in subconsciousness, there exists the same machine of memory and a duplicate of the roulette. This is how one intellect makes judgments concerning another intellect. The situation deteriorates when there are three lottery machines behind consciousness, that is, in subconsciousness. Here is the same situation. Two players, the system and the environment, the curtain, the audience and three machines. The audience has consciousness and subconsciousness. In this picture, we see that one lottery machine is completely full. This is a past stage of evolution. The second one is approximately 30% full. This is the current stage of evolution, which is filling up with experience. And the third one is absolutely empty. This is a fourth coming stage of evolution, which is informationally empty, although matrixly multi-predetermined. What I've just said can be interpreted with the help of another picture. Imagine these lottery machines in a different way. It comes to the fact that the highest hierarchical encompassing governance contains in himself everything. He is informationally absolute concerning all data. The highest hierarchical encompassing governance contains the whole informationally algorithmic entirety. The interim hierarchical structure in the universe a fragment of the universe possesses restrictedly saturated informationally algorithmic indications. As for the student system, it has even less informationally algorithmic saturation. In other words, this means that appealing to the highest hierarchical encompassing governance, man can get a reply through subconsciousness and his sense of measure. But in this case, the student system, man, has to at least recognize the existence of all this. If he doesn't recognize the existence of all this and doesn't think that he should appeal to the highest hierarchical encompassing governance, it goes without saying and it is natural that he won't get any replies. But even if replies from the highest hierarchical encompassing governance the Creator's infinite mercifulness come to him, he won't understand them, he will miss a prompt from above given in the language of life circumstances. This is another interpretation of the same thing. Therefore, a question can and should arise. What sets all this in motion? This factor can be named the principle of entirety and holism of the universe, which states, the universe contains in itself everything necessary to fulfill the cycle of its existence. This principle was actually set out in Slav Aryan Vedas, in the glorification of three glove in the Book of Vils. However, the content of this principle can hardly be revealed without going beyond the boundaries of this universe. Consequently, the universe exists as a process. The fragments of the universe are structures which cooperate with one another, develop under the impact of the surrounding environment, that is, other structures. The impact of the environment and the interaction of the structures are probabilistically predetermined, flow in the certain hierarchy, reflect in statistical patterns the statistics of cause-effect relationships, mutually reflect, which is an informational process carried by the pan-universal, hierarchically multi-level system of coding of information on different material carriers. A response of a structure and changes taking place within it is also a reflection, that is to say, an informational process 
flowing in the same system of coding on the levels of the structure, subordinate to the same probabilistic predeterminations, reflected by statistics. A response is of a probabilistic nature on every level of the pan-natural system of coding of information. Resonant phenomena in the hierarchical multi-level structures manifest as statistically more frequent or rare informationally different responses depending on vectors of state of the environment, the structure at the moment and in the process of their interaction. As information is accumulated by the structure in the statistics of the structure's responses to the impact of the environment, this leads to a less frequent appearance of errors that damage the structure. Responses become unambiguously determined in the sense of predictability of reflections, impact response. The interaction of the environment and the structure shifts into the area of rarer factors of impact. On the hierarchical level of the mentioned interaction, a variability of the structure's behavior manifests in the sense of multivariant predictability, impact response. An informational saturation of a level of the structure takes place, and the process moves on to the next hierarchical level of the holistic, common to all, pan-natural system of coding of information. What I've just said, let's try to illustrate in the following picture. Look, here is one structure and the other one. Each structure, according to the trinity of MIM, matter information measure, is material, possesses information, and is vested with measure. So, there exist structures A and B. Structure B exerts an informational impact marked by letter X on structure A. For example, a ray of the sun shines on a brick, which in its turn gets heated and therefore gains a quantum of warmth. In consequence of this impact, the measure which the structure possesses is changed. As soon as the interaction takes place, the measure immediately changes. In a good or a bad way, that's another question. As the measure changes this or that way, a disruption of the informational state takes place and matter, to some extent, is deformed. In the example of the brick, it is heated. A response in this case is of a probabilistic undetermined nature. Now, one more time, another impact, the same one, another quantum of warmth. As a result, the brick becomes more heated. Consequently, the measure and the informational state have changed. A response in this case is of a probabilistic random nature again. Now, imagine that the impact of this kind has been exerted throughout centuries. The measure is changing, the information is becoming saturated, the matter is changing, and the response is becoming probabilistically predetermined, and the brick splits into two parts due to overheating. What's more, over time it turns into sand. I know it is quite a simple example, a primitive one. However, this example at least gives one an understanding of how the process of the Trinity operates in reality, in practice. This scheme can be applied also to other objects. All processes are oscillatory, and the same oscillations in a probabilistically predetermined way cause such a response, which is correspondent to the meaning, the sense of these oscillations. Consequently, a structure reacts to a response in a probabilistically predetermined way. In this picture, there is an environment, an element, supersystem, possessing memory. So, the environment exerts an impact, and the response is of a probabilistic undetermined nature. 
then the environment exerts another impact. A response is of a probabilistic undetermined nature again. So the environment keeps on exerting impacts until the response becomes probabilistically predetermined. The response of the structure is formed in the process of combination on the basis of random sorting out of informationally algorithmic modules of the structure's memory, that is to say, on the basis of selection of probabilistic states, predetermined by the measure matrix. Informationally, a structure of this kind represents a combination of three functionally different formations, a determinant long-term memory, a probabilistic random access memory, a mechanism of random sorting out of informationally algorithmic modules 1 and 2. The determinant long-term memory operates in a strictly determined way. The answer depends on the question. A malfunction of this principle leads to damage to the structure. The seriousness of damage may be various. A selection of informationally algorithmic modules takes place on the basis of resonant, self-oscillatory and other phenomena, expressing a high coincidence of informational characteristics of the environment's external impact and the structure's inner state. Strings of musical instruments that respond with vibrational resonance to sounds of a certain frequency may serve as an example. For instance, there is a guitar hanging on the wall and a person just uttering sounds. If these sounds coincide with the frequency oscillatory characteristics of one of the strings, that is, coincide on the basis of notes, in this case, the guitar string responds. In this picture, we see two graphics. One of them shows oscillations of an environment, and the other one shows the structure. Look, what happens? The reading of the information takes place only when the system falls into a resonance. That is to say, a selection of information, a shift into a new state takes place only when the phenomenon of resonance takes place. The probabilistic random access memory stores up statistics of structures' responses and combinations of probabilistic responses to the impact of an environment. Herewith, the probability of extracting necessary for a right response information is subordinate to the frequency of address towards this information under the impact of the environment and the mechanism response speed of random selection of informationally algorithmic modules. Also, there are resonant and self-oscillatory phenomena, like in the determinant long-term memory. But, unlike the determinant long-term memory, resonant and self-oscillatory phenomena, aside from responses, bring about a change in the organization of informationally saturated levels of structure. The reaction of question-answer is multivariant due to informational saturation of structure. The mechanism of random sorting out is a mechanism of sorting out, dividing and uniting of informational links stored in the determinant long-term memory and the probabilistic random access memory. Herewith, in relation to the determinant long-term memory, the mechanism of random sorting out generates errors of functioning, as this mechanism generates a multivariability of responses, providing the probabilistic random access memory is available. As for relation to the probabilistic random access memory, the mechanism of random selection is a normal process the role of which is played by the entire complex of oscillatory processes in a structure with their random, that is to say, statistically an ordered phase or mode shifts in relation to each other and amplitude frequency characteristics. If there is a coincidence of phases, common mode signal coherence, 
then a selection of necessary information takes place. If this does not happen, information is inaccessible. In the mechanism of random sorting out, if we depict it as a graphic, then we will see that a selection of information takes place, not only when frequency characteristics coincide, but also the moment phases coincide. If phases of environment and system coincide, then a selection of information takes place. From all the information comes the following. In informationally unsaturated levels of structure, an emergence of coherence, common mode signal, of some processes with other external and internal processes is a change of the structure's qualitative state for a certain period of time within which, in the structure, there can emerge new formations and new processes. As a consequence of this, when the coherence comes to an end, the structure cannot return to the previous state, and thus a step up in development takes place. In this case, the factor of timeliness of coherence in relation to processes can be comprehended in two senses. In the sense of narrow time interval within which there is a phenomenon, or in the following sense. For structures with memory, not later than this information for development of those structures is needed, though within a certain period of time, the fact that those structures have already obtained this information may not manifest. Now, recall the global evolution process, the examples of the missile and those stages of development. First was the emergence of plants, then primitive animals, after that more complex life forms and so on. And further, a question arises. Under what impact did these stages, steps up in development, take place? Moreover, all this took place in a timely fashion, at the right time. This is what? An accident? Look, materialists state that all this is a coincidence. They see neither a factor of governance, nor a factor of timeliness. Now, I have something more interesting that I'd like to tell you. We've already explored the law of time and resonant time, frequency coincidences of biological and social time. Remember when these coincidences happened? This is something to ponder on. The previous civilization, Atlantis, was apparently developing along a biogenic path. However, in relation to its social development, it came to a collapse, a dead end, due to its crowd elite social arrangements. In Atlantis, which existed before us, the rulers of this civilization lived lavishly, regarding the rest of the population as subhuman scum, working mules. In order to prevent them from excessive consumerism, there was a ban on the wheel. Why? Because as soon as the wheel emerges, there immediately emerges scientific and technological progress, and people begin to develop. By the way, in ancient legends of the Incas, the Almacs in particular, in Tibetan manuscripts, it is revealed that the ban on the wheel existed. This indicates that the leaders of the civilization reached a high level of perfection, but they kept the rest as subhuman scum, working mules, in order to prevent them from consumerism. But the highest intellect had certain goals in relation to people, the same goals for those who regard themselves as elites, as well as for those who are regarded by the elites as subhuman scum. And if people in particular, and the super-system as a whole, do not carry out the tasks entrusted to them by God, then the pitcher goes off into the well, but is broken at last, which means it will come to its logical end sooner or later. And it was not God who destroyed Atlantis, 
It was the rulers of that civilization who brought the super system into such a state that it was rejected by the biosphere. However, subsequently, the next civilization, our civilization, developed along a technocratic path, which has led the crowd elite society to an objective collapse, as knowledge in this technocratic society must be given to all stratums of society. In all the aforementioned, God's design is manifested. This is also set out in the Quran. They planned and God planned, but God is the best of planners. Simply speaking, God has brought mankind to such a state when the crowd elite system has objectively come to an end. But for all this to happen, since all processes in the universe are oscillatory, it took hundreds of years for mankind as a certain super system to enter a new state, that is, to take a step up in development. How did this happen? It is an example of that very resonant phenomenon, coincidence of phases, or modes of biological and social time, and the super system, mankind, can never return to the previous state. Besides, all this happened in a timely manner, at the right time. What conclusion proceeds from all this? Common mode signal and coherence is one of the manifestations of timeliness during the flow of a combination of processes. This is a pan-natural factor pointing out a randomly created response, which possesses an informational saturation sufficient for a structure to save or to improve the achieved level of organization. With the help of the mechanisms we have looked into, the shift of various structures of the universe is implemented in the needed direction. To put it another way, generally speaking, governance is carried out through frequency processes. Going back to the things we discussed when talking about the chromosomal apparatus, the causes of mutation emergence are actually connected with oscillatory processes. In other words, at the right time, a certain informational impact is exerted by the universe and God, and the chromosomal apparatus changes so much that it begins to develop in the needed direction. And these changes are irreversible, they don't go back into the previous state. Summarizing the aforementioned, I'd like to say the following. Perhaps, at a stage of evolution, Having achieved a certain information processing power, the manifestation of all the previously named combination of information, people named intellect. But this combination of processes and factors occur in various frequency ranges, on various carriers of information, on various levels of hierarchy in the organization of the universe. Thus, memory alone is not intellect. The mechanism of sorting out of information alone is not intellect. The mechanism of transforming of information alone is not intellect. The mechanism of sorting out and transforming of information alone is not intellect if there is no memory, which expands this mechanism and if there is no detailizing informational basis, something that fills memory, which memory can also remember processes of informational transformation. However, intellect is the entire aforementioned complex of processes in man's psyche. With such an understanding, the universe as a whole, as well as its fragments, possess an intellect and an aspect of a personality and subjectivity. Intellects differ on the basis of particular fragments mastered by them of the pan-universal measure. Coincidences necessary for mutual understanding of intellects are 
on the basis of material carrier, in which the process of informational exchange between carriers flows, on the basis of frequency range of structures that exist and that are carriers of intellect. This topic will be more understandable when we talk about egregors. The fact is that there exist biofilm structures with which mainstream science does not deal and does not even want to deal. But these biofilm structures play a very important role in the life of mankind and every single person. What are called angels and archangels in religions, especially in Abrahamic ones, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, are in essence biofilm structures, which possess intellect and collective intellect, intellect of subordinates. This is what we will also talk about in detail in our next videos. Now, it is important to understand that there has to be a coincidence of frequency range between intellects. Eyesight, for instance, is a visual spectrum or range of frequencies. There is also a hearing spectrum of frequencies. And there exists such a spectrum of frequencies which is inaccessible for our senses. We therefore do not perceive them on the basis of clock and carrier frequency ranges, on which an informational exchange flows, on the basis of the system of coding of information. Here is an example. Supposing one intellect is Russian and another one is Chinese, then the communication between them becomes almost impossible, at least until they find a common system of coding of information. Also, it is important to understand that for all intellects in the entire universe, the common for everyone pan-universal measure can serve as the interface for communication. On the basis of energetic power necessary and or allowable for an informational exchange. On the basis of commonality of informational base necessary for mutual identification at the first and following contacts. That is to say, every intellect differs from other intellects by the measure of what has been mastered. Ruling, governance by intellect. Intellect is one of the means given to man's consciousness, and like every means, intellect is rulable. In this scheme of governance, we see the following. There is an object of governance, a subject of governance, a governing impact, and a certain result, effect. All this flows in the environment, including under the ruling of the highest hierarchical encompassing governance. And now, let's concretize this using the example of intellect. So, there exists man. Man has consciousness and intellect. He can impact his intellect, obtain a relative result effect, evaluate this result, and so on. Now, look what we have. If consciousness is disciplined, then even without a very developed intellect, a person can achieve his set goal. But if consciousness is powerful, good, but not disciplined, then, as we say, the wind is blowing in his head. In this case, consciousness tears intellect apart, and in the end there is no result, there is no effect. This concerns hustling people, who are always in a great hurry and precipitate with a mess in their heads. But how can one be disciplined? One has to cultivate, to grow it in oneself. For this, one has to know all we are talking about here. In order not to have a mess in one's head, one has to comprehend processes flowing in creation. What is the foundation based upon? It is based upon the trinity of matter, information, measure, 
as well as upon the understanding that all processes are governable. Let's sum up all we have been talking about. Expressing views on intellect from the standpoint of the sufficiently general theory of governance is inevitable, first of all, for the reason that the concept, the entire function of governance, is impossible to introduce without introducing the concept intellect. But in this case, regarding the process of the universe existence as a process of self-governance according to a certain, although it is unknown to us, entire function of governance, brings to the concept of the highest among intellects, who rules this process of self-governance of the universe according to the entire function of governance. Consequently, atheism, both materialistic and idealistic, in this sense are incompatible with the sufficiently general theory of governance in principle. Materialistic atheism is less dangerous, as it is directly grounded on the standpoint that God does not exist. But idealistic atheism is much more dangerous, as it states that God exists, but God is the way I see him, the way I tell you, not the true one who factually exists. By and large, we are talking about the fact that there is God who actually exists, and about a God who does not actually exist. The latter is spoken of in all religions. This is the trick. If there is no intellect, then the entire function of governance is impossible, as one without intellect cannot discern a factor of impact, which means one cannot form a stereotype of discerning and recognition. Without intellect, one cannot determine a vector of objectives, form a conception of governance, and so on, according to the items of the entire function of governance. All this implies a presence of intellect as an ability to create principally new informational algorithmic modules. Speaking of the highest intellect, the Quran Surah 67, Ayat 3 says the following. He who created seven heavens in layers. You see no discrepancy in the creation of the compassionate. Look again, can you see any cracks? Indeed, all processes are in order. The moon doesn't fall on the earth, the earth spins around the sun, everything in the universe is unordered, in sync, there is no discrepancy, all processes are oscillatory, and we see no cracks. Now, let's answer the question. Could the world exist if there were any cracks, discrepancies, that is to say, inaccuracies and non-determinations? To say it in another way, it turns out that governance in the universe is carried out by the highest of intellects. In this regard, let's go back to the novel The Master and Margarita, written by Mikhail Afanasyevich Bulgakov, to be precise to its beginning. But this is what disturbs me. If there is no God, then the question is, who is in control of man's life and the whole order of things on earth? Man himself is in control, was Bizdomny's quick and angry reply to what was admittedly a not very clear question. I'm sorry, replied the stranger in a soft voice, but in order to be in control, you have to have a definite plan for at least a reasonable period of time. So how, may I ask, can man be in control if he can't even draw up a plan for a ridiculously short period of time, say a thousand years, and is, moreover, unable to ensure his own safety for even the next day? And indeed, here the stranger turned to Berlioz, suppose you were to start controlling others and yourself, and just as you developed a taste for it, so to speak, you suddenly went and, well, got lung cancer. At which point the foreigner chuckled merrily, as if the thought of lung cancer brought him pleasure. Yes, cancer, he repeated, 
narrowing his eyes like a cat as he savored the sonorous word. And there goes your control. No one's fate is of any interest to you except your own. Your relatives start lying to you. You, sensing that something is wrong, run to learned physicians, then to quacks, and maybe even to fortune tellers in the end. And going to any of them is pointless, as you well know. And it all ends tragically. That same fellow, who not so long ago supposed that he was in control of something, ends up lying stiff in a wooden box. And those present, realizing that he is no longer good for anything, cremate him in an oven. Why? Even worse things can happen. A fellow will have just decided to make a trip to Kislovodsk. Here the foreigner narrowed his eyes at Berlioz. A trivial matter it would seem, but he can't even accomplish that, because for some unknown reason he goes and sleeps and falls under a streetcar. Would you really say that that's an example of his control over himself? Wouldn't it be more correct to say that someone other than himself is in control? And at this point the stranger laughed a strange sort of laugh. In other words, the question, who is in control of man's life and the whole order of things on earth, surprised both Berlioz and Bisdomny, two outspoken atheists. In this sense, in chapter 1 of the novel The Master and Margarita, when Voland, the name of the devil in the novel, asks the atheist the question, who is in control of man's life and the whole order of things on earth, is very important. For these two atheists, Berlioz and Bisdomny, man himself is in control, that's it. So it's like everything happens somehow by itself. But we already know that there is always an object of governance, a subject of governance, a certain informational impact, a certain result which comes not from nowhere, but is a consequence of governance, of an informational impact. Atheistic variations on theories of governance put man, mankind, either in the position of God or lose a commonality of presentation as soon as they touch upon the topic of the global evolution process. As these variations cannot say anything about the highest hierarchical encompassing governance in relation to mankind. Thus, due to the denial of the Creator's governing role, some fragments of the conduit governance process fall out of atheistic consciousness. The hierarchy of governance process perception by consciousness is disrupted, which in a predetermined way leads to errors in governance. These errors become part of goals themselves, as well as results of achievement of these goals. That is to say, the vector of objectives, goals, is set erroneously, in the erroneous direction. Stating that the Creator does not exist, they deny the impact of rhythms of the cosmos, the predetermination by God of being of creation. They deny the cause of His design and the realm of His allowance. By the way, all this has brought to a global system crisis, as all this, which actually exists, is not taken into consideration. Religious consciousness of the crowd elite society carries another problem. The dogmatization of holy scriptures is equating intellect and willpower of the people making these scriptures, editing and censoring them with God's will. This restricts freedom of a majority subordinating their freedom to the global, super-Jewish predictor, who also equate their willpower with God's will in the same way, which in its essence is Satanism. What is the way out of all this? People have to recognize the existence of the Creator and correlate their own vector of objectives with His vector of objectives. We people have to begin carrying out the tasks entrusted to us by God, 
for the sake of which we were introduced into the environment. The other approaches have brought us to a global system crisis. In this lecture, we looked into the fact that man is not the only one to possess intellect, but it is also the universe as a whole and its fragments that possess intellect. As for the encompassing intellect, it is God who possesses it. His intellect is the most powerful one. And it is He who rules all processes, including us. But ruling, or oh governance, cannot be aimless. Speaking of man, this means that there is a certain goal set in relation to us. How can we understand this goal? We have to establish a contact with the one who set this goal towards us. How can we do it? We can do it through our sense of measure. How can we understand whether we talk to God or an egregor? We can understand this through stability on the basis of predictability. If prompts are coming from above, we have to be able to see them. In brief, this is what we've been talking about. In the next lectures, we will look into the theory of supersystems. Super